GM 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 my name is Shobhit and today I am going to explain how do you create your own NFT collection and let your users mint from it. I have been running a YouTube channel called Web3 Club where I teach developers how to create Web3 applications or dApps as we usually refer to them. I have been a developer for more than a decade and I have been involved with cryptocurrencies since 2013 and have been actively working around it. If you are looking for more in-depth content on Web3 applications, please check out my channel Web3 Club or you can follow me on Twitter S-H-O-B-H-I-T-I-C. Now what is an NFT? NFT stands for Non-Fungible Token. What does that actually mean? It means that every item in the collection is different from the previous or the next item. Essentially what we do is we store a mapping of who owns a specific item on the blockchain and because it's a blockchain, it's a public blockchain, everyone agrees that this is the owner of this specific token and that is how ownership comes to you. You can change the owner of your own NFT. So what you essentially end up doing is in the mapping of token ID and owner, you change the owner for your token ID and that is how you transfer an NFT. Now let's talk about some notable projects. Uh, there was there's CryptoPunks, which is one of the oldest PFP projects. What are PFP projects? PFP are projects which give you an image or JPEGs as we like to call them. Uh, which you can use on your social media as a profile picture. So CryptoPunks was one of the first PFP projects, a 10k collection of PFP project uh, which was released on Ethereum chain. Recently, Bored Ape Yacht Clubs has become one of the biggest PFP projects because it was snatched up by Steph Curry uh, who is a big basketball player and Neymar Jr who is a big football player and a bunch of other celebrities. There is also a project called Cryptodes by Gremlin, which was the first CC0 NFT project. What it essentially means is anybody can use the images in that collection for whatever they want, but the NFT is only owned by one person. Another big set of NFTs are called generative NFTs and Artblocks is one of the biggest example of that. Now technically speaking, what is an NFT? How do you represent an NFT? So to represent an NFT, what we do is we use two things. Just like in a coordinate system, we have X and Y. In an NFT, we have smart contract address and token ID. The smart contract is designed in such a way that it tells us who is the owner of a specific token ID. So for example, a smart contract on whatever address has let's say 1000 items. So they will have token IDs from 1 up to 1000. So if I am the owner of the fifth token, what will happen is I will ask the smart contract who is the owner of token ID 5 and the smart contract will respond with my address. So that is how I prove my ownership of a specific NFT. NFT can also contain metadata like name, description and an image URL and bunch of other things, attributes, properties and whatnot. But these are the three main things that an NFT contains. And this image, the image URL that we have in the metadata is what we refer to as an NFT image or whatever, what people generally are showing off on their social media. The image is not stored on blockchain, only the reference to that image is stored on the blockchain. So for example, we will only store the URL of the metadata where we can actually go and then find out that metadata and in that metadata we will have a URL to the image. So you don't actually store the image on the blockchain, only the reference to it. Transferring NFT means changing the owner of that specific token ID. So if I own the fifth token ID and if I want to transfer it to somebody else, I will just change my address and put their address and I have methods to do that. And finally, we add limits to our smart contract so that it's assured that we cannot mint or create more than XYZ number of NFTs. That is how we make sure that only a certain people can own these. Now there are two types of NFTs, ERC721 and ERC1155. So now in ERC721, it is what you actually think of NFT. One token has only one owner. One item has only one owner. That is an ERC721 NFT. Now interestingly, we have another NFT type which is called ERC1155 where 
one token can have multiple versions and that is why one token can have multiple owners. So for example, uh, in ERC721, I have 10,000 items. Each item is owned by one specific person or wallet address, uh, technically speaking. Now in ERC1155, we can have, let's say five items, but the first item has 1000 supply, the second item has 2000 supply, the third item has 1000, the fourth has 2000 and the fifth has 2000. So now first item can have up to 1000 different owners or one person or one address actually can own let's say five of the first token ID. So that is basically an ERC1155. The, the biggest difference is in 721, every item is unique and they have a supply of one. In ERC1155, every item is unique, but they can have a supply of more than one. Now today we are only going to discuss about ERC721 because that is the most common NFT which is used. ERC721 is a standard which implemented by the smart contract. It creates an NFT compatible smart contract and that is what we refer to as an NFT. As I've already mentioned, one token can have only one owner and one supply. In ERC721, there are 10 different methods and three different events that we have to implement in a smart contract for it to be an ERC721 compatible NFT smart contract. Interestingly, metadata is completely optional. So we can actually have NFTs which don't have an image attached to them. And another interesting fact is that CryptoPunks, which was the first NFT PFP, it does not adhere to ERC721 specification because it was created before the specification was even formulated. So on the right side of the screen, you can see all the methods that are available that we have to implement for a smart contract to be an ERC721 compatible NFT. Uh, the one method that is miss missing over here is called supports interface which basically lets other contracts know that these methods are available. If we also want to add metadata to our NFT, we will need to add three different methods namely name, symbol and token URI. Token URI is the one which gives us the metadata URL which, where we go and then figure out what is the exact metadata. Now another thing that we will need to sort of understand is called Web3.js. It's a library by Ethereum which helps us to interact with the smart contracts or the blockchain in general. Also please note that this is not the only library that is out there, there are a bunch of others. Uh, this is just the one which is recommended by Ethereum itself. Now there are a few other things that we will need. Uh, we will need a wallet and I'll be using Metamask browser extension as a wallet. The network that we are going to use is called Rinke by test network. It's a test network for uh, Ethereum. And the IDE that we will be using is called Remix IDE. It's another an IDE by Ethereum where we can write Solidity, the language to program smart contracts on Ethereum. And we will be using Sublime Text to create our website. Now let's do some coding. The project that we are going to make today is going to look like this. It's, this is called Mistletoads and it's a project by Gremlin who created Cryptoads. This is also a CC0 project which means it's in public domain which means I can use it in any way I want. So I'm going to use it to explain NFTs to you. Now we are developers and we really like open source code. So Open Zeppelin is a company which has provided a lot of standardized uh, smart contracts for us to use and that is what we are going to use today. Open Zeppelin has its own ERC721 implementation which you can see on the screen and you can later go through it. They also have a wizard for us to use where we can just enter the values and get a smart contract that we need. So this is what the wizard looks like. I can enter the name, the symbol, the base URI and the features that I need uh, from this smart contract. So let me just enter the name dev creatures and the symbol DC. And for the base URI, what I'm going to do is use the metadata that has been provided for mistletoads. If I use the exact same metadata as mistletoads, my token ID 1 will be exactly the same as Mistletoad's token ID 1. 
because I'm going to use the exact same base URI. So I've copied the base URI for Michel Toads and I've pasted it over here. Now, as you can see on the screen, this is a big URL because it is stored on something called IPFS, which I'm not going to go deep into today. But, but what happens is with the base URI, you append the token ID at the end and you create the final URI for a specific token. So for example, for the token ID 5, I'm going to append 5 over here. So this will give me a URL which will return a JSON response of the metadata. So let, let's just try this out. I've opened the URL in a new tab and I'm going to enter 5 at the end. Now I press enter. So now as you can see this base URI is very big and that is because it is stored on IPFS. IPFS is a technology which a lot of NFT projects use uh, to store their metadata. If you click on the image URL, uh, you will see that there an image sort of comes up. This is the image which is shown in either your wallets or marketplaces like OpenSea, Rarible and all those things. To confirm, uh, I will open any NFT and I will change the token ID over here to 5 and you will see that it is exactly the same image that we are showing over here. This is the image on OpenSea and this is the image that we figured out. So hopefully by now you understood how does base URI impact how the NFT looks like. We've added a couple of features, namely mintable and auto increment IDs. So what mintable does is, is allows anybody to mint this NFT and auto increment ID is basically means you don't need to give me an ID. I will always increase the ID from the last minted NFT. The rest of the things you can just leave as is and then you click on open in remix. Remix is a solidity IDE provided by Ethereum Foundation which helps us creating the smart contracts to run on the Ethereum blockchain. Now the NFT code is sort of ready but you can see that in the safe mint function, the function that we call for minting or creating a new NFT, there is something called only owner which is written over there. The problem is that this means the owner, the person who has deployed this NFT, only they can mint an NFT. So we can just go ahead and remove this from here. Another thing that you will, you will notice over here is that the token ID is first taken from the counter and then the counter is increased and the token ID is given to a different safe mint function. This means that if the value is currently zero, we will create a, a token with ID zero. Now the problem is that we are humans. Humans don't want to start the arrays from zero unlike developers. So what you should ideally do is move this increment call to a line above the call where we are calling the current on the counter. Now another thing that you can do is because a user is going to mint it, they are mostly going to mint it for themselves. So we can remove this to address from here and on the line number 22, we can just call msg.sender. So msg.sender is a special variable which gives us who was the person who initiated this transaction, what was their wallet address. So we are basically just saying safe mint to the wallet address with this token ID. But how do people make money here? So another thing that we can program our smart contract to do is say if the person is not sending a certain amount of Ethereum, do not let them mint this NFT. So to do that, what you need to do is make this safe mint function payable. And to do that, you just go here and write payable. As simple as that. After that, you put a require statement over here. 
and in the require you write msg dot value msg dot value means what is the amount of ether the person has sent with this transaction and of course this value needs to be greater than or equal to let's say 0.01 ether and if the value is not greater than or equal to 0.01 ether we can throw an error with the message not enough ether sent add the semicolon at the end and that's it now you can take money from people to let them mint your nft so for 90% cases this is like more than enough for you to create an nft now there are people who do a lot more things uh, we don't really need to add that much complexity but one thing that we are going to add is we are not going to allow let's say more than 1000 of these nfts to exist so to do that what we will do is first create a variable called total supply and we will put that equal to 10,000 and then uh, we will basically require another thing which is the current value of the counter the current value of the counter should be less than the total supply so the current value of the counter should be less than total supply otherwise we throw the error with the message no more nfts left to mint all right so now nobody can mint more than 10000 of these nfts and they will have to pay 0.01 ether to mint uh, one nft great now we compile the contract and the compilation is very easy and you can just see that the compilation has sort of succeeded then over here we go to this place and we click on contract and we find the dev creatures contract now this remix ide it gives us a javascript environment so it sort of simulates a blockchain we are not deploying to the real blockchain yet so you can see the environment that it is giving me and it's called javascript vm so it's a it's a blockchain inside the browser itself nobody else can access this blockchain except me so on that blockchain i can just i can just click deploy over here and deploy this specific contract so i click on deploy and this tick sign means the transaction succeeded and the contract has been deployed you can see the contract over here and looks looks pretty good uh, if you see the if you see there is a method called token uri and if i enter any token uri over there uh, it will give me an error because no token has been minted yet so let's go ahead and mint a token mint an nft now to do that what uh, we need to do is send 0.01 ether and uh, as per this private blockchain we have 99.9999 ether so sending 0.01 is not a problem for us uh, to send 0.01 ether we select finney finney means one finney is 0.001 of ether so if i select finney over here this is the value that i'm going to send which is 10 finney 10 finney equals 0.01 ether so i've selected the value that i have to send and then I click on save mint the tick sign means everything worked and now if I try to find the token URI for the first I can see that it returns with a value and if I copy and open this value it will give me another metadata for the first token ID so congratulations you have created your first NFT smart contract deployed it to a private blockchain and seen that it works this is the complete smart contract that we sort of need now one thing that is remaining in this complete thing is how do you get the money that people have paid for this nft for minting a specific nft because whatever transaction that has occurred the value the, the ether that they have sent 
is deposited to the smart contracts address not your address so to do that what we do is implement a withdraw function which basically takes all the ether present in the smart contracts address and sends it to you now to do that it's a very simple two lines of code i'm just going to paste it uh, and explain it to you the first thing that we do is call it the withdraw function it's a public function so anybody can sort of call it but only the owner is allowed to execute it so even if somebody else tries to call the method will give an error the first thing that we check that re we require over here is that the address of this smart contract and the balance of this address is greater than zero because if it is zero there is no point propagating this transaction and then what we do is we get the owner owner's address we turn that address into a payable address by calling a payable method on it and then we call the transfer method the transfer method basically transfers whatever ether that is present in the smart contract to the payable address and the value that is that we need to transfer we figure out from address this uh, we get the address of our smart contract and then we call the balance method the balance method returns how much ether our smart contract has great so now we go back here again and we compile the contract and after the compilation is complete we try to deploy it just to make sure that everything is working fine so as you can see compilation sort of succeeded so we will go and remove our previous deployment and now we select the contract dev creatures again and click on deploy and just like that the contract has been deployed again to our javascript blockchain and now you will see that there is a withdraw method as well which the which only the owner can call and how do you know who is the owner you just call the owner method and return and it returns your address if you just want to make sure that this is your address just check it out 5b38 starts from 5b38 and if you see the account that you used was starting from 5b3 pretty sure it starts with 8 as well okay now this was on a private blockchain but that's no fun right how do we put it to a public blockchain so today we are going to do exactly that we are going to test this out on the rinke by network now to to do that what you will basically do is change the environment uh, to injected web3 you click here and then in the in your metamask uh, in your wallet you change the network to rinke by test network make sure you have some ether over there there are faucets present out there in the world which will give you test ether for these networks so just go ahead and use them now once selected you will see that rinke by network is written below the injected web3 option now you can just go ahead and click on deploy just make sure this account this account is the same as your own account click on deploy and then it will basically ask in the metamask as you can see uh, should we deploy this or not so i'm going to go ahead and click confirm and wait for it to deploy propagated and now you can see the transaction has has been confirmed the smart contract has been deployed and if we want to figure out what is the address there are a couple of ways first if i click on this this notification itself uh, i can see that uh, a contract creation address will sort of come over here uh, otherwise if you've done it through remix you can copy the address from here great now we've copied it so we can go to the rinke by uh, test network and paste the address over here and figure out what is the contract over there great so now we have the address of our smart contract that was deployed on the rinke by network we will also need one more thing called abi uh, which i will explain later and that is these are the two things that we will need for us to sort of interact with the blockchain smart contract that we have just deployed so now with the implementation of the withdraw function we are complete with our nft smart contract now if you go to the compilation tab uh, you will see that there are two things that uh, this thing is giving us one is the abi and the bytecode 
after waiting for some time i can see that i have received a contract address for the deployment uh, now this contract address is something that i will be needing uh, to sort of interact with the chain the two things that i will need are the smart contract address which I, you can see over here and the abi now what is an ABI? ABI stands for Application Binary Interface. It sort of just lets us know that these are the methods that are available on this specific address because we are just putting the bytecode on the smart contract or because we are putting just the bytecode on the blockchain, the blockchain doesn't really tell us that these are the methods, these are the types that are available. So we need to make sure that we tell Web3.js or any other library that these are the methods that are available on this address and these are the methods that you should only call. To find your ABI, you go to the compilation section of Remix and then you will find ABI over here that you can just copy. Now let's move on to creating the web part of this minting application. Now on the web side of things, uh, what we need is first a connect button which connects our website with the wallet and then we need a mint button which sort of mints the NFT through the smart contract. Now what, what I have done is basically written down some code uh, which helps us connect and mint the NFT. The first thing that you will notice in the code is this script. I'm including the web3.js. Uh, it's a very simple, it's very simple to do. Just copy this exact line and paste it in your head tag. The next, there are some UI elements, uh, which I will come to later. And then in the JavaScript part, I have two different methods. One is connect and the other is mint and both are async and then I await stuff in, inside of them. Now what I am doing over here on line number 22 is I am checking if window.ethereum is present. Window.ethereum is an object which is injected into the web page by MetaMask. MetaMask is a wallet which helps us interact with the smart contracts, with the blockchains and everything. It essentially helps us to send a transaction to the blockchain and make changes to the state. The next thing that I'm doing is I'm calling the et underscore request accounts method in window.ethereum. What it does is it tells MetaMask to please uh, connect with our website because once we make that connection only then we will be able to interact with metamask using code if this thing succeeds what we do is we put window.ethereum into a web3 object a web3 object expects a provider and window.ethereum is a provider which we can directly pass on to web3 so this capital W Web3 gives us an object which we store in the small W Web3 and then we use this Web3 everywhere in the code. So on line number 26, you can see that I'm fetching the accounts, the total accounts that were connected uh, and I'm just using the first account that the user had selected and storing it in an account variable. After that, I make some changes uh, to the UI I basically add the account value in the wallet address section. I make sure that the connect button is not visible anymore. And I make sure that the mint button is visible now. After that, what I do is I create a contract object uh, using web3.eth.contract. It requires two things. One is ABI and the other is address. Now to get the address, we go back to uh, sort of our transaction and we can just copy the address from here and put it over here in our address variable. And for the ABI, we go back to the remix and we copy the ABI. The ABI is going to be very long because there are a lot of methods in there. So I've copied the ABI, I'm going to paste it over here. And you can see the file is suddenly 500 lines long. All right, now that I've saved it, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, open up my terminal and start a small server. 
uh, with Python simple HTTP server. Once the server is up and running, I go to localhost port 8000 and you can see this is the UI that we have. The first thing that you will see is there is a wallet address which has no value attached to it and then there is a connect with wallet button. So now if I click connect with wallet, uh, this is the what button we call this connect method and here we are just trying to make a connection with the metamask. So I click on connect with wallet, metamask pops up and it is asking me whether I want to connect this this wallet uh, to, through, to this website. So I click on next and I click on connect and the connection has been made. Now you, it shows my address over there and the connect button is, been, is removed and now we have a mint and NFT button. Now how does this mint and NFT button work? So when I click on that, I'm basically calling this mint method. Now in the mint methods, method, I have contract uh, which I had created in the connect method I have contract methods, so to get all the methods of a contract, I just call contract.methods. Contract.methods sort of returns an object with all the all the methods available that, that were defined by the ABI. Uh, and in there, I remember there's a safe mint method and it expects nothing actually, so I don't need to send anything, but if there were any arguments in that method, I would have sent it over here and then I'm calling dot send. Dot send means I want to send this transaction. Now to send the transaction, the first thing that I need to add is from. The from is the address from which I want to send this transaction and the value. Value means how much ether I want to send. Now if you look at it, look at it over here, you will see, oh my god, I'm trying to send so much ether. But the thing is, blockchains don't have floats, they have integers, they have unsigned integers. So to get a decimal value, what we do is we basically assume that there are uh, the last 18 or so specifically talking about ether, Ethereum over here, the last 18 digits are after the decimal. So that is how we sort of denote it. So because here you can see that there are 17 characters, uh, this means this is 0 0.001 sorry, 0 0.01 ether. So one ether would actually mean one and then 18 zeros after that. So yeah, this is what the mint method does. Uh, it sort of calls this, calls this method on the contract and it pops up on the metamask and metamask will say, do you want to send this money to this smart contract to do whatever the contract is saying? All right, so I go back to my Firefox and I click on mint and NFT. And once I click it, uh, the MetaMask pop-up should come. And you can see the MetaMask pop-up has actually come. Uh, the Ethereum that I'm sending is 0 0.01 uh, and the gas fee is pretty low because it's on the Rinke by Test Network. So I can just go ahead and click on confirm over here and wait for the transaction to confirm. Once the transaction confirms, I will receive this NFT, this one NFT. And now we are just waiting for the transaction to confirm. Lo and behold, the transaction has confirmed and I can click on it to make sure that it has actually propagated. Uh, so this just takes a little time on the Etherscan to show up. But now what I can do is I can copy this address and go to testnets.opensea.io and I can just import my collection to the testnet on OpenSea. Now, how do we do that? We basically go over here, we click on my collections, and then we, we click on import an existing smart contract. We click on a live on a testnet because we are live on a testnet right now. If you were not live on a testnet, you will select whatever net you were live on. You will enter the smart contract address over here but first you need to make sure that one of the NFT has been minted because otherwise OpenSea does not get to, does, is not able to figure out that this was an NFT. And I press on, press on save and you can see that there is one, one token here and that is available for me to see. And I, because I'm the owner of this 
uh, NFT collection so I can make changes but uh, you will not be able to but now you can see that there is one item over here that is being shown uh, if I were to click on this item it will show it will say that this is owned by me you right so now what I will do is I will mint one more of the NFT I'll click mint an NFT over here and uh, I'm going to click on confirm wait for the transaction to propagate and it has propagated uh, and once the transaction has propagated I can just um, go ahead and refresh OpenSea uh, if I refresh OpenSea I should be able to see two NFTs now and lo and behold it says two items uh, it shows one NFT though and why is that the case because it is caching all right so uh, I can actually go and uh, change the token ID to two over here and you can see that the second NFT is also owned by me now maybe maybe this I'm lying and you know the third one is also present so I can just check that as well I can click press three over there and you can see that I'm getting a 404 because the third one is not present great amazing uh, and I think this is something this is basically it for how do you let your users mint an NFT from your website now one thing that is not I have not explained is how do you let your let yourself withdraw this withdraw the money that was sent to this smart contract uh, and what we'll do is we'll build a small button right now which will basically help us do that so I, you can check out my uh, wallet over here it says that I have 0.2745 ETH because I've sent 0.02 ETH to the smart contract so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to create a new function called withdraw which will be async and it will be a function <laughs> and now I just need to await the contract dot methods dot withdraw and then I have to send this from my account now one thing is I don't need to send a value again because I'm not trying to pay it I'm just trying to withdraw so I, I need I need not send any value right now so I just press save I add another button over here which on click calls the withdraw method so I go back I click refresh I connect with the wallet and then I click on withdraw and when I click on withdraw uh, the metamask again pops up because I'm trying to change the state of the smart contract so I'm I have to give a transaction to do that so this is why metamask pops up and is it is asking me for gas fees uh, which I confirm and then I wait for metamask to sort of update right now it is 0.2745 once the transaction propagates it should be more than that it should be something like 0.29 something something the transaction has propagated and you can see the 2745 ETH has changed to 0.2945 so that is how you withdraw the ETH that was sent to your smart contract alright to summarize what we did was first we created an NFT smart contract uh, what that means is basically has it, it implements 10 on 10 11 different methods uh, that are present in the specification uh, after after we create that we deploy it to a blockchain once it is deployed to the blockchain we invite the public to sort of mint from that uh, NFT smart contract now you cre also create a website which connects to that NFT smart contract and has and calls basically specific methods on that contract with the value or the ether present in them uh, so when when your users come they click on the button and they send some ether to you after the mint is over or whenever you want you can go ahead and call the withdraw method on the on the contract so that the eth that was sent to that smart contract you can then basically take it out uh, withdraw it back to your own address and 
there was no permissions required uh, we did not have to like talk to OpenSea and tell them please give us your API keys or something like that because everything was happening on a permissionless blockchain thank you so much for joining with me on my session on NFTs if you would like to learn more about web3 development please check out my YouTube channel or follow me on Twitter my handle is web3club GM wag me peace out bye bye Thank <laughs> you.